All right. Thanks, Kat. Thank you so much, Sarah. And um, thanks to Seth Coast Shire for putting on this event and um, letting me come and speak to you tonight. Uh, my name is Kat Lavers, as Sarah just mentioned, and uh, I'm over in Northcote, so I'm not on the Surf Coast. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, who um, I'm sure had their own food preservation practices that I, I hope I get to learn <laughs> from, um, from someone sometime soon um, as we start to uncover more and more uh, about the culture and the, the history uh, of food in this landscape stretching back 60,000 years. Uh, so my background, as Sarah mentioned, I'm a gardener and um, I'm a home cook and I do preserving at home. And I was, I've been taught and mentored in food preservation by a number of people who have done it their, almost their whole lives, uh, which is fantastic. But I've also supplemented that by reading lots of food science publications, um, particularly uh, around the updated methods that we now know are quite important to ensure your safety and the safety of your family. So what I'm presenting tonight is a mix of my personal experience um, the received um, preserving wisdom from um, my mentors and also hopefully this evidence base that we get from researchers and food scientists. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. As Sarah mentioned, we grow uh, almost all the fresh fruit and vegetables with a couple of important exceptions at home. And that means that we have a lot of produce sometimes that we want to preserve for when we don't have produce at other times of year. So if we want to eat plums in the middle of uh, winter, then we need to bottle them. Uh, so that I, we do a lot of preserving and um, I get a lot of practice. Um, but I also know there's some very experienced preservers that are in this session with us. So I'm hoping that they will also pop some tips and ideas in the chat window as we go through. I have a couple of goals for tonight. Um, the overriding goal is to help you make a confident start uh, as a beginner, which I know not all of you are. Uh, the little sub goals in there are for you to be aware of but not put off by some of the safety considerations around preserving that I'm going to talk you through. So I want to strike a fine balance here between making sure you're informed, but also feeling confident that you can start. Uh, I'm going to go through preserving fruit tonight um, because fruit is a really often a really accessible and easy entry point for people who start preserving. And I'm not going to show you every method that exists because we don't have enough time for that. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the two types of preserving that I think are the most useful and that I use the most in my house. And that is bottling and drying. But we will have a chance to talk about jams and um, using some special equipment like steam juices and some of the other types of preserving that you can do like fermentation uh, at the end if you'd like to do that as well. And finally, I'm going to finish off with some resources for you so that you can keep learning if you want to and follow up on some of the things that I'm saying. So I really hope that sounds like a good plan for you. And as Sarah said, we're going to do Q&A throughout the session. And so feel free at any point to pop um, questions in the chat window. Uh, and I think it's a particularly good mm -hmm. idea because we're talking about some processes here that are um, they're quite not finicky but there's steps that it's important that you're clear on so um, please feel free at any point if you're a little bit unsure of something I'm sure someone else will be as well and it'd be great if you could put that question in the chat window so that I can help to clarify what I've said and make sure that we're all very clear by the end of the session. Um, now um, I'm going to share some notes with you. Uh, I'm one of those people that takes extraordinary amounts of notes because my memory isn't that great uh, so I've produced pretty detailed notes. I'm going to encourage you to um, maybe look at them, but don't feel like you need to read ahead because we'll be going through the contents. Uh, and of course, they'll be available from Sarah at Surf Coast Shire after the session as well. So on that, I'm going to move over to some slides, but I've got some uh, videos and pictures and a little bit of text for you and um, we'll get going. Okay, so I'm going to start with why would you preserve and also when not to, which might sound counterintuitive, but I think there's a good case for not preserving sometimes. So uh, the reasons that I preserve are to make the most of my harvest and um, for some people also being able to buy some really cheap seasonal produce when it's at its peak of flavour and perfection and then to store that away uh, is a really appealing reason. 
And feel free to pop your own reasons in the chat. We know, by the way, for how um, uh, why you'd like to preserve. I also like to do it because it reduces re reduces waste, both in terms of not wasting any produce that I've grown, although of course I do like to swap and share as well, um, but also not wasting the energy that's gone in to the packaging and the transport of food that I'm buying. Uh, because I, I actually, I'm always surprised that there's more energy involved in, um, for example, making an aluminium can than there is in the contents of that can. So um, from an energy perspective, the can is the most valuable thing, not actually the contents inside. That always spins me out. So when you're avoiding packaging and transport um, and refrigeration, um, not, not for these type of preserves, but for other produce, you are actually reducing a whole lot of waste that you'll never see. Uh, and of course, having some stored produce is about resilience as well and giving you a bit of a buffer in case um, you need it. Uh, and we know that a lot of people feel more secure with some food on the shelf when incidents happen, as we found out recently with the pandemic. So having a pantry with preserves um, can be quite good from that perspective as well. Uh, we've got some comments in the chat window, people wanting to make food last longer. Yes, there's a little smiley face. And of course, having too much fruit that you can't eat fresh. Thanks, Yolan. Another one for me is that I know exactly what's in the food that I'm eating. And um, when I talk about unnecessary additives, the probably the most common one that I try and avoid lots of is sugar. Uh, which is so common in most commercial fruit preserves and can often be one of the main ingredients in some products, uh, which I'll show you later. Uh, but also uh, other random preserving agents that are not really necessary, but are there for cosmetic reasons. And um, one example is those uh, brightly coloured dried apricots, which are normal. Uh, that is not what an apricot looks like after it's been dried. Uh, so it's still appealing, but it does get a, a, a more browner and darker tone after it's been dried without any kind of preserving uh, agent, uh, sorry, a preservative uh, chemical agent added. So that's a big one. I also really, really like doing one batch of bulk food preparation and then being able to enjoy that at a moment's notice for the rest of the year. Uh, we've just finished up our um, big bulk tomato processing for the year and I've got some photographs of them to show you. And it's a beautiful thing to come home exhausted in the middle of winter, open a bottle of beautiful sauce that you've made and tip it over some pasta and um, not have to think too much because it's already so delicious. And um, finally, I also love to give away some of my preserves and people appreciate the effort that's put in. And it's also very sustainable, of course, um, uh, being made from recycled uh, jars and then also the, the produce that maybe you've grown as well or sourced locally. But there is a but. All this preserving, it does take effort and energy and equipment. And uh, it's a lot of work if you've got lots and lots of trees and produce that you want to preserve. So after uh, busting my guts preserving for um, a decade or so at the plumbery, I have a few things that I try and um, do to reduce the amount of preserving that I need to do. And first and foremost, I would really recommend designing a food garden so that you can pick some fresh fruit all year round. Uh, we're in a very... Um, special climate in somewhere like uh, Victoria uh, and in particular more urban areas around Melbourne and we can actually design a garden where there's fruit fresh every single month of the year uh, with some correct and um, sort of careful choices to fill uh, seasons where there's not as much. So see if you can just have like one fruit tree ripening a month and then you will cut down the amount that you feel like you need to preserve. Next rule I have for myself is that I only preserve what I love and what I'm really excited about opening and using. And this is based on a, a bad habit I got into early on, which was having too much of something that I didn't like that much and then preserving it and somehow expecting that I was gonna love it and wanna use it when it was in jars. And unfortunately, a lot of those jars um, just sat there on the shelf unused because I wasn't very excited about them. And then they get to a point where you feel like, oh, can I still use them because they're uh, three years old or more. So now I try and preserve small amounts, uh, lots of diversity, 
uh, of things that I really love to eat just to make sure that we're cycling through them um, quickly. And also uh, there are some preserving methods that are quite expensive or expensive equipment uh, and some which use lots of electricity. And so I'm also biased and I'm trying to encourage more low tech methods that have uh, simplicity and that you can do using the equipment that you've already got. So that's the sort of thing that I'm going to cover in this session, acknowledging that if you want to spend a lot of money on fancy equipment, uh, you're able to do that and um, yeah, yeah, there's, that, there's that option for you. So uh, we're going to start with how does preservation happen? And I have a little challenge for you. And the challenge is to have a look at this bottle of barbecue sauce that I picked up from a primary school fundraiser a couple of years ago. Um, this is an old photo, by the way. And I'd like you to have a look at the uh, bottle and have a look at the label and tell me what the preserving agent, agents or processes are for this bottle of barbecue sauce. Uh, have a go. Um, pop your ideas in the chat window. So what is it that is safely preserving this bottle? And I've got some ideas in here. I've got vinegar. Um, we've got salt, vinegar, salt, <laughs> salt, vinegar, salt again, salt, sugar, um, garlic. Yep. Um, yeah, lots of ideas coming through. Cloves. Um, now, so some of those are preserving agents. Um, some of them aren't. And I'm going to say none of them are actually what is preserving this barbecue sauce. So um, have a think about that. I'll, I'll walk you through a few things to start with. Um, it's not time either, unfortunately, Catherine. <laughs> uh, but they're all actually really good guesses. And I ask you this little challenge question because this is quite a key point, especially for people preserving at home. Um, it's so important to understand exactly what is doing the preserving for this particular product that you want to make and um, making sure that you do enough of it or have enough of it to um, make that work. And Catherine's actually struck it, so it's heat in this case. Uh, but I'll come back and I'll walk you through these things one by one. So, well, firstly, what's not a preserving agent? Garlic is not a preserving agent. Chili is not a preserving agent. Spices are not a preserving agent. They're often used in preserves, but they don't have any um, effect on prolonging the storage of the item. Um, chilies go mouldy, for example, so, um, so it can tell you something <laughs> that they're, they're not going to fend off mould. So what is actually doing some work? Um, potentially salt. Salt is a pres preserving agent. In this case, though, the salt is a tiny, tiny proportion of the ingredients. Uh, it's listed last here. Um, things that are preserved using salt usually use quite large quantities. Uh, if you've seen salt dried olives, they're packed in rock salt and they're wrinkled and <laughs> shriveled. Uh, and another way that salt is used in preserving is for lacto fermented foods, where a very, like a salty brine is made. Um, and that actually is using acid. Uh, so I'll skip down to acid because the, the salty solution is creating an environment uh, where only uh, organisms that are helpful, like lactobacilli, for example, which creates an acid, <laughs> is able to exist. So in that case, the salt is, in, in the example of sauerkraut, for example, salty water is creating an environment where the right bacteria can produce acid and acid is what is preserving the sauerkraut. Well, it's getting complicated, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, so salt in this case is just a small ingredient. It's not actually doing the preserving, but it could be a preserving agent when used in large quantities. And that's actually the same for sugar in this context. Something that's preserved with sugar is gonna have a lot more sugar in it. So um, for example, jam, uh, is, can, can be preserved using some heat as well. But um, jams are often around 50% sugar uh, for commercial jams, and you can stretch that a bit lower for a homemade jam. Uh, and that will preserve. But if you don't have enough sugar and you had too much moisture relative to the sugar, 
your food will actually start to ferment into alcohol, which is how we get mead, for example. So we need quite a lot of sugar and salt. Uh, with acid, we can see in this uh, label, we've got some vinegar, but again, it's not the acid here. <laughs> it might make it a little bit more stable in your fridge and on the shelf, but that is not what allows me to stick this in the pantry for two years and then open it safely. Uh, what else have we got? Removing air. So of course, if we dehydrate, then we just remove the moisture from a food. And that means there's no moisture to support little microorganisms. And so they can't invade our food. Um, removing, uh, sorry, I just had a little brain fade. So removing air would mean putting something in a vacuum um, or putting something under oil, for example, that's the removing air. And then removing water, as I've just said, is about uh, removing the moisture that allows organisms to thrive. And um, we've also got temperature last on the list. And so for this preserve in front of you, the barbecue sauce, what has actually made it shelf stable is heating up this jar with its contents and keeping it at a high temperature for a long time so that it's um, effectively pasteurized. And then uh, as the contents cool down, that lid gets sucked down as the contents contract. So it's created a, a vacuum seal that's not gonna allow anything else to enter the jar. So I know it's a fairly complicated uh, answer, but I hope you can see that the key point here, which is that when you're making any kind of preserve, you need to know exactly what is doing the preserving and make sure that you do enough of it or have enough of it to get the job done. And hopefully that'll be a bit clearer when we go through some of the other uh, methods to follow. So the first method we'll, well, the first technique we're gonna use is bottling. And I've got two different methods to show you of bottling. And this is a little snap of our pantry. So you can see, I guess I do a lot of bottling and I use a couple of different methods uh, to do it for different reasons. Uh, but probably the first topic to cover here is which bottles and jars can we use? So I have another little challenge for you at home. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Jolyn, I, I'm glad you like the pantry. Uh, have a look at these jars and tell me, are they suitable for preserving or not? Which, which ones are suitable? And I can see a question from um, Sarah, can I reuse glass jars and their lids for bottling? That's what we'll hear right now. And how do I prepare the lids? And we're gonna come to that a little bit later. Catherine's saying all and Yolan's saying all and depends on what. Um, and that's actually correct for this photo. All of these types of bottles and lids can be reused. Um, so it's actually not true that you can only use screw on lids. You can use the bale top bottles as well. Uh, and I'll show you some other ones by contrast for, for what you can't. Um, and James has pointed out they're all suitable if the seals are working and that's correct as well. So we're gonna look at them in more detail soon. What about these jars? Are these suitable, yes or no? Uh, yes, depends on what you're preserving. <laughs> yes, yep, absolutely. These ones are all suitable. The one on the left is a special purpose-made preserving jar that's very common in Australia because it's an Australian company, Fowler's Vicola. And um, you don't need to have these jars, um, but they are special preserving jars. I, I don't, I'm not going to focus on them much tonight because unless you get lucky and you find a box in an op shop or you have someone give them to you these jars cost about five dollars each and then you still need to buy seals and buy lids so this is quite an uh, expensive choice if you're wanting to get started preserving and um, if you did want to use them or you found some there's lots of videos to show you how to put the kit together or at the end I can show you one of mine if you like uh, but that is a an Australian special preserving jar the one in the middle is a bit of a trick question because you can't tell by looking at it whether or not it's actually a preserving appropriate jar. But this lid, you'll have to trust me, it actually has one of those little vacuum seal lids. It's not a pop top lid. It doesn't make a pop when you press it, uh, but it does have the ability to um, be a vacuum lid. I'll show you the underside of some lids in a minute. 
And the one on the right is a kiln jar with a rubber seal. And these can be used for preserving, but you need to make sure that that rubber ring stays in good condition, as with all the lids, in fact. And um, you need to replace that rubber ring if it starts to become brittle or crack in any way. So it should feel a little bit soft um, and, and pliable uh, to stay safe. Okay, I've got another picture of jazz. What do you think about these ones? Just leaving a pause for audience participation. <laughs> but probably you've all worked out that um, I haven't shown you any no jars yet. And so this is the no jars picture. Uh, so for the bottling methods that I'm about to show you, these jars are not suitable. And mostly it's to do with the lid, although I wouldn't recommend preserving in plastic um, anyway. But uh, glass is good. It's just these lids are not designed to be resealed. Uh, without any industrial equipment. Uh, so none of these plastic jars um, and plastic lids rather are appropriate. I still save these because I like to put, for example, salad dressings in them or fill them up at bulk stores, but I don't use them for bottling. Okay, so now we're gonna hone in on lids and having shown you the types of jars and lids that work, we need to get a little bit more um, clever at assessing the lids for whether they're in good condition. So the lids that are leaning up against the wall are showing you um, two uh, lids that have the ability to vacuum seal. Um, the one on the left is in perfect condition, the larger lid standing up here. The one on the right I would still use, but you are probably only gonna get one more use out of it. And then you will need to buy a new lid. And I will give you sources for those sorts of things at the end of the session. And then in the foreground, you can see some common faults. Uh, and these are quite extreme versions, I would say. So just be careful that do look um, for things that are smaller than this. On the left hand side, you can see the underside of that jar I was saying was a trick question just before. This is what it looks like. Uh, and just as an aside, you can see that it's got this rubber ring similar to the jars leaning up against the wall here. And so that tells me that this is a lid that I can use again um, for preserving and sealing at home. And you can see this lid has been damaged through use and it's developed some scratches that have started to rust. So unfortunately, I won't be using this lid again for any bottling and I will keep it for maybe storing some herbs or spices in the pantry, for example. Here's a rather extreme dent, but even subtle dents in this area of the lid are a big problem because they really do interfere with the seal and that means that if you're someone who struggles to open jars sometimes, then you need to be quite careful about not damaging the lid when you do that. Uh, there are some grippy tools that can help give you leverage or you know, maybe try some weights and see if you can develop some more upper body strength, uh, but don't use any jar opening tools that damage the lid like this, otherwise you'll be in big trouble. Uh, you can of course replace the lids for those jars if you want to use the jars. And over here, we've got some discoloration uh, I think it's about to start rusting. There's some obvious stuff going on with this lid. So we're not going to use that one again either. All right, so we've got our bottles, we've got our lids and we've checked them carefully. And I, I do need to go through a couple more safety precautions with you before we start. Um, so there are lots of different types of organism that can spoil food. And the correct preserving methods that I'm going to take you through tonight are designed to prevent all of these. Uh, but there's one particular type which we worry about especially, and that's botulism. And we worry about it because it's, it's very rare, but it's also very deadly. And uh, it also has no taste, no smell, no visual indicators. And it's not written on the slide, but it's also not destroyed by boiling. Uh, so it can just sit there and be completely undetectable in your jars uh, if you haven't followed the correct safety steps. So um, just, just to give a little bit of context, we have apparently about one case of botulism poisoning a year in Australia, and that includes all sources of botulism, including from the soil, um, infant botulism, uh, as well as from preserved foods. Uh, and often they're commercially preserved foods as well, but it can and it has happened that people preserving at home have um, ingested botulism. 
And uh, so I need to talk about it here, but I just want everyone to know this is actually very rare. And if this was a really seriously dangerous thing to be doing, I would not be teaching it, I promise. So keep these in mind, um, but also try not to panic about it either. So what we're gonna do firstly to stay safe is we're only going to use foods in our bottling that have enough acid in them, either natural or acid that we've added uh, when we're using methods that are low oxygen. Low oxygen preserving methods are bottling because we're using a vacuum seal, which excludes some air. And uh, also putting produce under oil, which is an interesting one. And um, sometimes this advice isn't built into preserving books. I was looking through an, a book on Italian preserving that I have on the shelf uh, last night. And this book does outline methods where it says to put herbs under oil, for example. It doesn't tell you to add any acid. So um, unfortunately, that method is not considered safe. And I, I tell you that to make the point that you need to have these in mind and not necessarily um, rely on books telling you this because some of the older um, methods um, will, will not have these sorts of considerations built in. Secondly, and that's this is leading into it, use modern recipes from reliable sources. <laughs> and if you're making a chutney, for example, or a salsa, don't vary the quantity or the ratio of acid uh, acidifying agents like lemon juice, citric acid or vinegar because she could unwitt unwittingly be tipping that pH over into an unsafe zone. Um, and the final is if you've got some very low acid fruits and vegetables, which we're about to look at, I would recommend choosing another method and there are lots of them like freezing or drying or pressure canning. Um, so you're free to uh, make your own choices but I would I would certainly recommend that. So uh, let's have a look at some pHs. And um, actually, I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to share a different document as well. Um, and this is something that you can get a hold of if you haven't already picked up a copy through the chat window. Let's have a look at the pH of some common foods. Um, call out in the chat window if there's any that you're interested in and I can try and find them for you for the next minute or so. So I'm just going to leave you to have a look and if you pick up any patterns, let me know in the chat window. And Sarah wants to look at pairs. So we're going to zoom down to pairs and we'll find them here, 3.5 to 4.6. And I, I actually am not sure if I put this in the slides yet, uh, but the key pH cutoff for botulism safety is pH 4.6. So what that's saying is that within the pairs that they've tested of this variety, there is a range and some of them will be right on that margin, um, Sarah. So for pears, they're one of the fruits where we recommend adding a little bit of acid to be very safe and sure. Uh, okay, we've got someone else interested in pears. I hope we've covered that one. I haven't seen any other. Uh, we don't have conference pears, I'm afraid. So we've only got Bartlett, which is one of the main commercial varieties in, in Australia. Uh, but you could expect that pears would be around this range. And uh, I recommend adding some acid to them for complete peace of mind. All right, haven't got any other requests. So I guess the main patterns to take away from this are that there are most vegetables, in fact, um, that are not within that safe range. And this is actually one of the reasons I'm talking about fruit tonight. I'm not gonna cover a lot on um, vegetables. Uh, strawberries, we'll just have a look at them for Sarah. Strawberries are very acidic, three to 3.9. So they're safe without any extra acid, hooray. Um, so vegetables, most, uh, most likely you need to add acid or choose a different method. Um, going down to raspberries for James, where are they? Here, 3.2 to 3.95, so also in a very safe range. Uh, we've got lots of fruits which are quite acidic. We've got some that are on the margins and we've got some that are very much in the unsafe range. And a lot of those tend to be, um, the, or, like lots of tropical fruits like mangoes, ripe mangoes you can see here, 5.8 to 6. Keeping in mind that pH is not a linear scale and every one 
increase is actually 10 times the one before. So a pH of six is 10 times more alkaline than a pH of five. So small differences in here are actually quite large differences in acidity. So they're the main patterns and you're welcome to get a copy of that PDF and look up more produce. Um, but the things I'd like to draw your attention to just once again, are uh, that we've got these high acid fruits that are less than 4.6, where we don't need to add any acid. We've got low acid fruits that are just a bit more than pH 4.6. And it is recommended that you add some lemon juice um, or some citric acid to these fruits. Uh, what may shock you here is that tomatoes make this list. So I want to acknowledge this goes against a lot of um, old Italian practice. And my partner who's worked with Italians uh, he, virtually his whole life in hospitality was a bit shocked when he saw this. Um, but they have now tested in labs tomatoes which are over pH 4.6. And um, so for complete um, evidence-based safety, you should be adding a little bit of acidifying agent. Uh, and then we've got, as I mentioned, we've got the very, very low acid fruits. And here are just some examples. And again, I would recommend preserving these with some other methods or combining them with other very highly acidic ingredients such as vinegar, ideally in a recipe that has been tested to make sure it will be in the right range. So that, that's why we can have mango chutney because it's been combined in a recipe with other things and um, the pH has been adjusted using usually vinegar uh, or lemon. All right, so just a little bit of other general advice and then we'll get on to the more interesting stuff. We've already talked about making sure your bottles and jars are in good condition. They need to be clean um, but they don't necessarily always need to be sterile. And what we'll talk about how we can sterilise jars and produce together using one of our methods. We've got to make sure that we heat these up to the right temperature for the right time. And again, I'll talk you through this soon. But I wanted to note here that if you are in a mountainous area, high altitude area, you actually need to look up the right temperature and the right time um, because of the different pressure water boils at a different point. And um, so there are tables that you can look up for the right preserving methods uh, for anyone who might be in those circumstances. Also need to again remind people that if we have a sudden temperature change in glass, it can and will break. And I've still broken bottles quite recently. So this is a really common thing that can happen if we're not careful. So if we've got cold fruit, we go into cold bottles, which go into cold water. Hot fruit goes into hot bottles, which go into hot water. And we're using tea towels and cardboard so they don't knock around together when they're being preserved. And also, when you take a hot bottle out of a pan of water, uh, it's really important you don't put it on a cold bench top, like some of the stone bench tops that are very popular these days. If that's cold, then the bottom of the jar will crack. So to guard against that, we're going to put them on a wooden chopping board or in fact any chopping board or a folded towel or something like this um, so that you can um, prevent that from happening. Uh, finally, just be, be, be careful around hot things. Um, but I also really recommend jar lifters, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And if you do notice any warning signs like mould or lids that are bulging or rising bubbles, um, any off smells when you open a jar, just play it safe. Uh, don't taste it and discard and check your method. And often people are very keen to taste it because you don't want to waste the produce. But it is possible for moulds to affect the pH of the contents, which means that you might have opened up a window in there for something else, for example, botulism to come in. Uh, so although in some food preservation methods like fermentation bubbles are great, um, it, it isn't something that I would encourage you to do if the jar has been sitting there for a long time, possibly developing um, the mould. All right, so I hope uh, everyone's breathing deeply and feeling okay after that safety advice. I'm sorry I have to really wade into that, but I wanna be very clear about what makes these methods safe or unsafe uh, to avoid some of those hesitant moments where you're just not sure whether you're doing the right thing or not. 
So we'll go through two methods now. And the first one I've called cold pack. And um, there are quite a few different names for these methods, but I think cold pack describes it best. We're packing the fruit into bottles when it's cold and the, the bottles are cold. And then we're proceeding with the heat uh, stage. Now this is a bit boring, but I thought I would write a quick overview of the process to help you wrap your heads around it before we go into each step. And again, you're going to have very detailed notes if you don't have them already that you can refer back to. And of course, you're free to watch this video again to go through these steps if you need to. So in this method, cold pack bottling, cold fresh fruit, cooled stewed fruit or juice is packed into unsterilised, cold but clean jars or bottles and capped with unsterilised lids. Jars are then placed into a room temperature water bath that is brought up to temperature. When it's at a gentle boil, a timer is started for a prescribed time so that the jars and the contents are sterilised together. Jars are then removed and placed on an insulated surface. And as the jars cool, the contents contract to form a, a vacuum seal. That's the essence of it. So now I'm going to go through all the steps um, now you've got the overview in mind. Uh, so we've got a, an equipment list here. Part of what makes preserving happen smoothly is just having the right stuff in the right place at the right time. So I thought it might be helpful for you to have a list of what to get out and prepare. Uh, so firstly, jars and lids we've covered. We need some type of acidic fruit as we've covered. You'll want a clean damp cloth for wiping the rims of jars. You'll need some kind of steriliser and um, you can buy sterilizers. And I was extremely lucky to have some friends who found this fantastic steriliser in an op shop for 50 bucks. What a bargain. And um, called me and asked me if I'd like it. And I said, goodness, of course. Uh, these are really quite pricey and happily you don't need one of these. It does though plug in and have a thermostat, which makes it quite convenient because you'll automatically get the right temperature every time. Some uh, libraries and some community centres actually rent these out to people. And sometimes you can borrow them from equipment libraries, tool libraries, et cetera. And given that you're probably only gonna use them a couple of times a year, I think that's so appropriate and really useful. So um, look out for those sorts of resources that you might be able to use or maybe share one with a friend or a neighbour. As you can see from my smaller photos here, it's basically just an urn and it's got an element in the bottom to heat it up and it's got a little rack that covers the element. And really you can use a, a stock pot to create a similar effect on uh, a stove top. So what I've got below this is the diagram showing you the layout that you need to make sure you have and then a, um, an example of a stock pot being used for this purpose. Uh, Yolans asks, can we use a huge urn? Most likely, yep, absolutely. This really is just an urn that I've got here. Uh, so um, it's probably not in the, the warranty advice, but uh, if it fulfills all of these criteria, then I'd definitely give it a go. So the thing to be clear on here is that we do need clearance Aha, uh -huh, that's an unintended pun. A clearance around the um, all of the jars. We need water to be able to circulate so that the heat can start moving around effectively. And we also need some clearance for uh, the boiling water to make sure that it doesn't splash around. So you can see the recommended distances in the diagram. And what it means is you probably want at least 10 centimetres above the height of whatever jars you're using. And you can actually do multiple layers of jars if they're small as well, uh, but just make sure that there is some clearance between them um, for the water to circulate. So in other words, you often do this with a stock pot because it's a really tall pot and regular saucepans are usually only good for very tiny jars or small batches. Um, these are the jar lifters that I was telling you about before and the reason I recommend them is because there's just not much common kitchen equipment that you can improvise to lift jars safely out of boiling water. So these jar lifts, and in particular this design, um, which I, I actually prefer, 
is um, a really great tool and they're about $20 to $30 from preserving shops and you can buy them online as well. So I think they're a really important safety tool for people if you're going to do this regularly. Okay, so we've got our steriliser in some shape or form. We're also going to use some tea towels, probably not your best ones, for packing the jars in. And you can also use cardboard at a pinch if you want to. You'll need a timer probably on your phone these days. The jar lifter, as I mentioned, a wooden chopping board or towel or some kind of insulated surface to put these jars on when they come out. And of course, labels. And see if you can spot what I use for labels later on. <laughs> Okay, now the steps, we'll go through them one by one. And again, I'd love you to ask any questions to clarify as we go through, just to make sure we're really um, happy with this process. So first of all, inspect and clean all our jars and bottles and lids as we've talked about. Just in soapy water is fine and just do a quick visual inspection on them. We're going to prepare our fruit and we're going to prepare um, any preserving liquid and uh, then we're going to start to pour or pack the produce tightly into our jars and bottles, leaving about 1.5 centimetres at the top of each jar or bottle, which is called the headspace, for the contents to expand when they get hot. Um, so, um, and then the final step is we're wiping any uh, produce that gets on the rim, um, just to make sure that it doesn't interfere with that seal trying to form and screw them on finger tight. I've got a video here that I'll show you now of me doing this process with apples. Um, I'm gonna pause it occasionally because sometimes Zoom struggles with voiceover video. And what you notice me doing in here is packing them tightly. It's not compulsory for them to look beautiful, uh, but you do wanna make sure that there's a lot of them in the jar because if you're adding too much liquid like water, you're diluting that acid again. So we want to make sure that we've really got mostly apple um, in the jar and not the liquid. And yes, just to clarify, Sarah, these are uncooked apple slices. They've been sliced, but you'll see I've got them in a bowl of liquid and that is water that I've just squeezed a little bit of lemon juice into. And this is not to do with changing the acidity of the preserve. It is just to stop them from going brown before I can get them cooked. Uh, so it's a purely aesthetic thing that you can do or you can leave out as you wish. Speed that up a little bit. Okay, so pay close attention to where I stop and notice I'm just packing them down tightly. And if I pause it there, just notice that I've left about one and a half centimetres headspace before the top or the, the rim of the jar. And it's quite important that we don't fill the liquid up past this point because we don't want anything to be pushed out of the jar and get stuck in that rim when it gets into the hot water bath, um, because that, again, it will affect the seal um, that's trying to form. Oops, sorry, going back. Um, so uh, you saw me put in some liquid there. This liquid is actually just water. And this is a bit of an update. A lot of the old preserving books will almost exclusively use sugar syrup. Some of it extremely high in sugar. Uh, but what we know now is that because sugar is not the preserving agent here, again, that the heat is what is preserving these apples, we actually don't need the sugar for um, effective preservation. What sugar does do, of course, is um, for some people improve the flavor, but it also uh, does keep the color and the consistency of the apples nicer over a longer period uh, because of those light preserving effects that the sugar will have in that watery liquid. So uh, you can use straight water. You can make a sugar syrup with just diluting um, sugar and water over heat. You can use a bit of honey in there if you want to. You can use some other kind of liquid. 
Uh, so you can use any of those things as long as you're, you're, you're clear that we're using the heat as the preserving method here. Okay, the next steps we've got are, oh, sorry, did I actually, I might have just skipped a, um, the last part of the video there because I do put the lid on. <laughs> Popping the lid on and we're just doing it finger tight and that's all you need at this stage. All right, so we're moving on now to the next steps. We're going to pack these jars into our steriliser, uh, making sure there's some clearance at the bottom so they're not directly in contact with the heat and so that the water can circulate around them. We're gonna use tea towels to separate them and avoid them breaking if they knock against each other. We're gonna fill the steriliser up with either cold or, or slightly warm water, but definitely not have it very hot. And then uh, make sure that there's a bit of clearance over the lids. I've said five centimetres here. I think actually 2.5 or one inch is enough. Um, so the water level ash is not just to cover them, but to have at least one inch again, so that we can have heat circulating. That's a bit of an update from older methods as well, where they used to sometimes only have the water coming up about halfway on the jars or, or three quarters. The um, food scientists tell us now that the water really should be covering with about an inch to make sure that the entire contents of the jar are getting the heat that they need to be safe. Then we'll turn on the heat and we're gonna bring it up to a gentle boil. Here's a bit of an image of what that looks like. And you probably can see I've got some tea towels just snaking around these jars to give them a little bit of um, a, a buffer so that they don't have um, glass bashing against glass as the boil starts. Once it's at this temperature and definitely not before, you can start your timer and process for um, the recommended amount of time. Now, this is a point I wanna be really clear with you and honest uh, about what I do and what food science tells us. Uh, the technical reference that I'll share with you after this session says that the temperature should be at 100 degrees and there are specific times depending on the type of produce and the size of jar that you've got and of course um, altitude as well as we talked about earlier. However, in practice I actually find it's quite unsafe because 100 degrees Celsius can get quite violent and even with tea towels and things in there, you, they move around and you end up with jars breaking and broken glass. And so what I was taught by a chef who ran a preserving program um, at, a, at a community centre was that she uses 40 min 45 minutes of processing time at just below a boil, so about 95 to 98 degrees, and do that for all small to medium jar sizes. So, um, so what I'm doing here is holding it at a fractionally lower temperature, but holding it for a much longer time. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge the difference there and let you know that also everybody that I know who does preserving at home seems to do it this way as well. Um, but technically speaking, the 100 is what food scientists will recommend. So you're completely free to make your own choices there. Uh, this is at 95 to 98 degrees is just below a boil. It's a very high simmer. Simmering can start quite a lot earlier at I think maybe 85 degrees. So this is the point where it's just below breaking into that vigorous um, rolling boil. Uh, but yes, feel free to look these temperatures and times up and particularly do that if you're using very large jars because there's just it just takes longer for the heat to get right into the center of that jar for safety. Let me know if you've got questions or comments on that. Um, but we will move on now just to the last steps. I don't unfortunately have a video of this for you, but I think you can all imagine me safely using that jar lifter. Um, or you could actually leave these to cool in the water if you want to as well. Uh, and then setting them on a wooden board or a tea towel if they're hot so that they don't have any temperature difference with your bench top. And um, when you're lifting them out, the key here is we're gonna avoid disturbing the lids. So using that jar lifter, for example, we're trying to go under the lid and around the sides, not holding onto the lid itself uh, because they're quite soft at this stage and the seal hasn't actually formed. 
it, it forms as the jar cools. So it's quite important that you don't touch the lids in any way at this stage uh, until the lids have really had that chance to cool down and seal properly. We, um, after taking them out, we will monitor them. Uh, if you have had a fail, if you didn't pick up on a dent or something like that, usually you know about it pretty quickly. So um, I'd recommend keeping them somewhere that you can check them for about 48 hours, just to make sure that you don't see any of those signs. And after that, you can pop a label on them and you can store them in somewhere that, that's cool and dark, ideally. Okay, I'm just gonna address some of these questions. Um, so again, to clarify, I don't do the rolling boil. So I'm not doing the rolling boil and then turning it down. I'm just bringing it to that very, very high simmer of about 95 to 98 degrees. Um, should the lid always indent and then pop up when we open? That's a great question. Not all lids actually do that. And the ones that you can hear a pop when you press them, um, that they are the pop top lids. So you should hear a pop, uh, but you don't always hear that um, with some of the modern lids, that the surface of them does uh, go concave. It does look like it's sunk slightly, but it's very subtle and a bit hard to pick up when you're a beginner. Um, so yeah, don't be necessarily thinking you'll always have a pop lid, um, but yeah, there are, there's a range out there. Can we boil them again if it hasn't worked? Um, you could do that. It's quite likely that there might be a fault in the jar or the lid. So often I would transfer them to a, a fresh container if I was gonna try again. Uh, or you could just put that container in the fridge and then eat that within a week or so. Yeah, all really good questions, thank you. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Um, but we, we can come back to it again if we need to clarify any of those details. And I'm glad that we are. The second method we're going to cover now is hot pack bottling. And um, in this one, here's, here's the overview. We've got stewed fruit or juice, and it's at a gentle boil or a high simmer on the stove top. Our jars and bottles are sterilised in a hot oven. Uh, lids are sterilised in boiling water. The hot fruit is quickly ladled into hot sterilised jars and capped with a hot sterilised lid. As the jar cools, the contents contract to form a vacuum seal. So there's some similarities there, but we're starting with everything hot and then we're combining it together. And here's an example of some elderberry syrup, which is a bit similar to a juice uh, that I've bottled using this method. So I've got another bit of a, a sort of safety announcement here as well, and a bit of a gap between what the food scientists tell us and what people are actually practicing at home. So this, this method, hot pack bottling, is also known as the open kettle method, and it's no longer recommended by the National Centre for Home Food Preservation, which is a US-based organisation specialising in preserving at home, as there is a small risk of spoilage using this method due to air exposure while bottling. In other words, while you're putting all these pieces together, a little spoilage organism could get in there from some dust in the air, or being blown around, etc., and could ruin the, the batch. So if that worries you, then you should use the cold pack method instead of this, or you can add an optional boiling water bath like we've just covered as an extra step in this process. Uh, so full disclosure, I do use this method, but I only use it for quite low risk, very high acid foods. And um, it is so common, but almost everyone I know who does preserving uses this method. So um, the risk is there, but it must be very small. That doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to it, but I want you to know that this is a method that's still being used. Even if you don't want to use it, it also just helps you understand the range of um, pieces of advice that are out there and, and know the differences in method. Okay, so I've got my list here for you for equipment. And in this case, we'll also be using an oven. Um, we need a pot that will fit all of our produce. We need a probably a wide mouth metal funnel. This is another bit of specialised preserving equipment that it's not easy to, 
just improvise from other things in your kitchen. And this is the picture of it here. Uh, basically just allows chunks of fruit to drop through into a jar, uh, which a normal funnel won't. And metal is good because if you've got very hot jars coming out of the oven, it's not ideal to be putting something plastic on them, which can of course start to melt. So once again, these are not very expensive and you can pick these up from preserving stores quite easily. Uh, if you don't have one, you don't want to get one, you don't have to have one, but you have to be very neat and careful when you're filling the jars up. And then of course, you'll need probably a ladle, uh, a bowl that fits all of the lids that you're going to use, a clean damp cloth, ideally a jar lifter uh, and tongs as well to help you get the lids out of the bowl. Again, some wooden chopping boards or towels and some labels. Um, I'm just reading with interest, Yolan saying, we use this method for jam, but we place the hot bottles in an insulated box with blankets on top and wait for them to cool down slowly. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you, good to know. All right, so once again, I'm gonna walk you through the steps and we'll have a look and um, see how the process differs from our last method. Assuming we've inspected and cleaned all the bottles and lids, we are now gonna place the um, jars and bottles in the oven and set it to about 150 degrees. We want to keep the lids separately though, that's quite important because the lids can be damaged by that heat. So we'll actually put them in a separate bowl on the bench top and we're going to cover them in boiling water in just a minute. We're going to bring our fruit uh, to a high simmer or a very gentle boil on the stove top and this is what it's going to look like. <laughs> You're going to start to hear bubbles and you see bubbles in there uh, but it doesn't need to be at an explosive um, rolling boil and that, that's going to make this process a bit dangerous as well. So just make sure it's at this point and then as you're going through adjust the temperature if you need to to keep it around this level. All right when everything is laid out and your jars and bottles are at the, the oven's temperature your equipment's all there. At that stage, pour boiling water through the funnel all over your lids and that will sterilize those lids for the next step. Then uh, you're gonna do this next step quite quickly because as we mentioned, there is a risk if you leave things, you, you'll just increase the opportunity for a spoilage organism to come in. So this is not something that you'll set up and then finish the next day. This is something you're gonna do quickly and carefully um, for the next couple of steps. Now we're going to remove a couple of jars from the at a time from the oven and we're going to place them on the, the board. What I'm doing here is a quick check to see what temperature the jars are at and as a little side note these are another pair of jar lifters and I just don't recommend these ones because it's a major design flaw that they're all made of metal. And of course the metal heats up when you stick it into a pot of boiling water. So the other ones that I showed you that have an insulated handle are a much better design if you're looking to invest in them. All right, my fruit's hot, my jar's hot. Have a look and a listen. Okay, so hopefully you heard the sizzle in there and you saw the sizzle. And that sizzle is telling me that there's a big temperature difference between the fruit and the jar. Um, and the jar is too hot in this case. So we're just gonna wait a moment until that sizzle disappears before we start filling the jar up. And again, we just have that risk of the jar breaking if the temperatures are too different. So it's not a big problem. We just need to wait a minute for the jar to cool down uh, before we start to fill. Then uh, once we're happy it's the, at the right temperature, we're going to fill it up and we're going to wipe the rim of the jar and screw the lid on finger tight and then move it across. And I've just got a quick video of this process for you. Just a note here, I don't take more than two or three jars out of the oven at a time because I don't want them to get cold while I'm doing this. Uh, so just a couple is good. Yeah. 
you might notice this is quite a ridiculously sized funnel. It's actually the top of a grain hopper that I found in a garden shed that was part of a stash of long forgotten preserving equipment. So it's a slightly unusual one. I'm wiping the rim carefully to make sure that I got no, um, no produce on it that might interfere with the seal. You don't need to do that if you can see it's clean, but I just wanted to demonstrate for you. And then I move it out of my way over to another insulated surface. A question here, don't your fingers burn? Yes, you can burn your fingers in this method. And um, I might have just burnt the tips enough that I don't feel it anymore. That's maybe another disadvantage. It's not a method I do with kids, definitely not. Uh, so in, if you're worried about that, then again, I'd recommend you use the cold pack method. All right, and then um, uh, once you've got them on that chopping board finish, again, we'll, we'll avoid disturbing those lids because they're not properly sealed until they cool down. Uh, at this stage, technically, if you follow the food science advice, you should actually be putting those jars into a boiling water bath and processing them, probably for a short, shorter time, uh, but processing them in there just to avoid any chance of anything surviving um, that might have come in from the air while we were filling them up. Uh, I, I don't know anyone who does this, but I, I feel it's important to tell you that. And um, I certainly encourage you to, to do that if, um, if you'd like to. Uh, then similar process, we monitor these jars for about two days just to make sure that we don't see any signs that there might be an issue with one jar. And then we're going to label and store them in a cool, dark place. And a follow-up to the burning fingers question, what about oven gloves? Yeah, I mean, in theory, it's great. It's just that it's also quite hard to move reasonably fast and to hold jars in an oven glove, um, which is why I'm not using them. Uh, and again, this process does need to be done fairly quickly. Uh, so that's why I'm not using them. But otherwise, I think oven gloves are a great idea. Right, now I've got a couple of different examples for you of how you can handle produce using these different methods. Uh, we do a lot of tomato preserves here and um, I thought I'd show you some of the variety that we've got going on in the pantry. We have just completed our um, tomatoes, as I said. So the bottom or the left-hand photo here is showing you some pre-prepared sauce uh, in recycled beer bottles that my partner makes. And sugo is Italian for sauce, by the way. And so Danny uses this method where he makes the sauce in a big pot on the stove, lets it cool a little bit, and then puts it into these um, cold but clean uh, beer bottles. And then he'll cap them with the beer caps. And then he puts these into the boiling water bath, and brings it up to temperature and processes them. So that's uh, the cold pack method that we talked about before. Uh, the other jars that you can see here are the Fowler's jars, the special preserving jars that I mentioned earlier. I, I, when I started preserving, got given a few crates of them. But as I said, I don't recommend you go out and buy them at $5 a jar plus all the seals. Um, this is a very expensive choice. But still lots of people have got them and inherited them. And if you're doing the Fowler's method, then you're doing essentially cold pack but the, the seals um, are just a unique system for the Fowler's kit. Um, what else? We've also got some salsa up here. Danny's fantastic tomato salsa, the sauce, not the darts. So you can have a little bit of fun with the names. And um, you could do a hot pack or a cold pack method for salsa. Uh, the advantage with salsa is that because it's a product where you, you like it to feel quite fresh, um, sometimes the whole that the hot pack is better because you don't have to hold the produce inside at a temperature for such a long period, which means it doesn't break down with so much heat. So I particularly like using hot pack um, when I'm doing um, things that I want to have a, a, a more solid consistency at the end of the process. Again, with um, ketchup, you could do hot pack or cold pack um, on your preference and um, well, I thought I'd show you this photograph in particular because I found this poor neglected bottle of tomato sauce in the back of the pantry that was preserved in 2018. And I want you to just look at the colour difference compared to a more recent preserve 
of the same preserve um, behind it. Just have a look at the colour change that can happen over time. And that's not a safety issue, but it is just showing you that even after being preserved using these methods, uh, enzymes will still be at work in the jar and the texture and the colour and the flavour will slowly decline over time. Um, so we'll, I think we'll probably still eat this, um, but I prefer to use these preserves within two years. And um, I, I do expect a little bit of a change in colour and texture when they've sat around for a longer time. Um, and finally, the jars on the right hand side are the squash them in a jar technique, which I learned from my friend Maria Chiavrella. And um, I love this technique because you literally get your tomatoes and you squash them into that jar, uh, fresh tomatoes that is. And you may tip off a little bit of juice if they're very juicy, but you just keep squashing tomatoes in until you've reached the 1.5 centimetre headspace at the top. And then you'll wipe the jar in because of course you probably made a mess. And then you'll pop the lid on and um, uh, do the cold pack with them. It's actually a mistake there, sorry. I wouldn't do a hot, um, a hot pack with these uh, because they're already squashed. So yeah, just cold pack if you're doing the squash them in a jar method, but it's a lovely fun one. So there you go, some examples of uh, tomatoes in our pantry. And we've gone through those two different preserving methods. Before we get on to drying, I think I might just pause there, check with Sarah if I missed any questions and just check with you if there's anything that you'd like me to repeat. Um, tell me uh, what is still unclear to you about these processes. Um, Sarah's saying no questions and there's a, a bit of a silence. <laughs> so I hope it's a good silence and you feel clear about these two methods. Uh, we'll stop at the end and if there's anything that's popped up in your minds by then we can come back to it as well. All right, uh, so we're going to go to drying now, which is the next technique that I use most frequently in my house. And I've got a range of some of my dried preserves there for you to see. We've got uh, some fruit leathers, we've got some sultanas and some plums, some dried persimmons and some figs from my neighbours next door. And you can make some pretty gorgeous looking fruit mix uh, by combining all of these together, which I love to do. When we're drying, what we're doing is we're, we're racing. We're, we're racing to take moisture away before mould sets in. Um, and the great thing about dried food is that it is so light and so compact and it also has quite a long shelf life if it's stored correctly as well. So you can take a, a huge bowl of produce and really shrink it down to something very manageable and portable if need be as well. Um, I want you to have a look at the middle photograph there, which is showing you the volume reduction in persimmons in a drying um, machine, a dehydrator. So I can absolutely pack that frame out and then have a look at how much they've shrunk when they're ready. So um, this is a method that you would use if you've got quite a bit of produce, um, not small amounts, um, because honestly, one of the issues here is you can often eat dried fruit a lot more quickly than fresh fruit. And you can whip through, you know, about five plums without noticing. And um, it makes it not very efficient if it takes you a long time to dry them. So keep that in mind. It's probably for larger quantities here. Now I've got some general tips for fruit to dry. You want temperatures that are between 40 and 70, um, actually probably on the upper end of that range with good airflow because that moisture needs to move away. We want to try and slice the fruit probably as, quite as thin as we can safely, but just as important is that the slices are very even. And for example, in the top left and right, you can see an even and an uneven slice. And what will happen on the right hand side is that that piece is going to dry at a very different rate to most of your other produce. It's not always a problem, but it's quite annoying 
and um, it's just much better if you have them nice and even so things finish around the same time. Can you use one of those fancy slices, I'm being asked. I think you're talking about a mandolin, but maybe there's some other equipment that I don't know about. I'm sure you can, yep. Uh, and it would probably be a really good use for it, but I don't have one in my kitchen. So feel free to use kitchen equipment if you can see an easier way of doing some of these steps than hand slicing. Uh, now, when you've dried the fruit, sometimes some of the methods we're gonna talk about, which are a bit more exposed, you may have insects that visit the fruit and they can lay some eggs on them, which I know it's quite gross. It's not a safety risk for you, <laughs> but um, it is gross. And um, what I'd recommend is that once the fruit is dry, you seal it up very tightly in some, um, you know, Ziploc plastic bags or a very tightly sealed container and pop that in the freezer for about two days or a bit, even a bit longer, two to three. And um, that way those eggs are going to be deactivated and they will never hatch into moths or um, maggots in your pantry. And just the, the key tip there is that when you take it out of the freezer, very cold things from the freezer get quite wet because they attract all that condensation. So make sure that it comes back up to room temperature before you open it. Otherwise, all your hard work with dehydrating the produce is going to waste. And um, final tip here, when you store your dried fruit, um, make sure it's in airtight containers because it will just absorb moisture from the ambient environment uh, and it can get quite humid in some kitchens and pantries and your fruit can get a bit soft and, and sticky and, and just lose, um, lose the dehydration effect. Uh, so yeah, do make sure you've got a nice tight seal. Some people even recommend packaging it in smaller airtight containers so you don't need to open a whole container at once. I haven't found that necessary, but I, I just want to put a note in there that you don't leave this out in the open air. Will Makona jars be okay? Is that a coffee jar? I don't, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't actually know what a Makona jar is. It is okay. Uh, if they've got a tight seal, and I, th I think if they are what I think they are, that they've got a plastic lid. And one good thing about plastic lids is they are very slightly flexible and that means that they can be screwed on and sealed quite tightly. So that could work really well. Um, but yeah, just check out the jar. Uh, you might even wanna fill it with some water and and tighten it and then just check whether any comes out and um, check the seal in some way. Uh, it, it won't be a problem in the short term, but if you want really long storage, then the airtight is quite key. Great. Okay, so let's talk more about some of these drying methods. You've got lots and lots of options. The first method, the easiest, but also the most expensive and the most energy intensive is to use a commercial dehydrator. Um, I've got one, I'm trying to move away from it, but they are really handy in autumn when there's often not a lot of sun and when we don't have the heater going yet because it's still quite moderate temperatures. Um, so I am using them for my persimmons because they seem to crop at that really, really awkward time. Uh, again, this is a fantastic um, a piece of equipment that you could share with friends or family or neighbours or uh, get through some kind of tool library or community centre uh, because you probably aren't going to be using it very much. The other option we have is to use an oven. And if your oven seals very well, which not all ovens do, let's be honest, if it seals well, you may need to prop the door open like I've done here with a wooden spoon to make sure that the air can actually leave. Otherwise you get a very steamy environment in there and you don't get any dehydration happening. So if you've got an oven that can hold a nice low temperature around the 50, 60, 70 degrees, then you can absolutely dehydrate using that instead. But we've got some low tech methods and these are exciting for me because they just use what's available, what's naturally available and free and that is sun and heat and this is a classic tried and tested method just um, uh, sort of staple gunning some shade cloth to a wooden frame and then leaving it on a corrugated iron roof in the sun 
And the corrugated iron reef is a key part of the system here because it's allowing air to move around through those channels. So it's allowing that movement of air that we've talked about. And uh, as most people will know, when you touch a corrugated iron reef, even on a only moderately sunny day, there's much more heat on there than anything at um, normal at ground level. So we're actually amplifying the dehydration effect uh, by putting these things on a corrugated iron reef. Uh, if you're worried about birds and insects, you could make another frame and put that on top. Um, I and um, other friends of mine in central Victoria who do a lot of this drying have not actually found birds that interested, which is interesting. Uh, ants could be if they found it, but often those reefs are too hot for the ants to be climbing on in the daytime. Uh, of course, you don't want to be leaving this fruit out overnight. You may be visited by rodents and uh, also might rain while you're in bed. So you do need to bring these screens inside and put them somewhere safe. And for that reason, I advise you to make your screens a size that you can carry and get through doorways quite comfortably. Uh, but that's a lovely technique, very, very simple. And just as a, as a guideline, moderately hot summer days, about um, four days of being out on the roof is usually enough. Uh, if it's taking longer than that, you're probably risking mould setting in. And um, actually, if I just go back to the previous slide, uh, you'll see an example of that down the bottom here. Uh, what's happened? with these pieces, it's a very subtle thing, but these are actually the outside slice. And so it was a bit more sealed from the skin on one side. Whereas these other pieces up here were slices from the middle of the persimmon and they were able to dry out from both sides because um, it was the soft inner flesh. So these ones here got a bit moldy and that's the sort of thing you'd be looking for. Um, and uh, any traces of that and um, Obviously, you're not drying fast enough to prevent that mould. Yeah, so probably like three to four days. And if it's taking longer than that, then unfortunately, this is not a good method for wherever you live or the time of year. And then uh, the other thing you can do using the same screens is find a warm microclimate in your house and see if you can get the food dry in that way. Um, we are lucky to have a very tiny very efficient slow combustion stove in our um, main area and we have this fabulous drying rack that I made out of a child's cosh that I found in hard rubbish and it's on a pulley system so that it can get right up into this hot air pocket at the top of the room and we put a thermometer up there to check and it gets about five degrees hotter than the rest of the room up there and sometimes more uh, and there's a lot of air circulating and we can also turn a fan on in the room to enhance that effect. So this is a fabulous little drying climate for us. And um, I'm sure somewhere in your house, you, you'll have um, a similar microclimate, even without a wood stove, uh, just a normal heater, for example. And um, you may be able to dry food without using any other special equipment. So I'm wondering if uh, you'd like me to explain any more about these methods. Uh, any questions at this point before we move on? Just scrolling through, I can't see any more questions in the chat window, so I will move on. Uh, and I want to show you another um, way of drying food, which is making your own fruit leathers. And um, it uses very similar methods, but there might be a couple of tricks I can help you with here. Oh, I've got a question from Yolan. How long does it take with the commercial dehydrator? Uh, it's still a fairly long time. You're looking at um, probably about two days. So you don't save a lot of time by using some of the slower methods uh, in there. It, it depends on um, how juicy the fruit is. It depends on how much skin there is protecting it. Like uh, grapes, for example, are hard to dry because the skin around each piece prevents the moisture from leaving. Uh, so sometimes people treat the grapes um, to, to try and break them open a little bit before they dry them uh, for easier. And look, same with oven drying. It really depends what temperature you set it at and how thickly you've sliced it and um, what the produce is and so on. 
Um, but we, you're not talking about, you know, done in four hours um, unless you really crank that heat up and uh, you, you can start to get more cooked flavours if you do that. So for most of these methods, I'd expect them to take around two days, um, maybe slightly longer. So, yeah, it's a long time to have your oven on. It's a long time to have a dehydrator on, which is why I try and encourage people to experiment with the lower tech methods where possible. Okay, fruit leathers. Uh, using all of the stuff we've just talked about, but just a couple of extra tips. Uh, what is a fruit leather, first of all? It's a homemade version of a commercially available um, roll-up, which, um, for example, is real fruit flat out, if you listen to the marketing and you grew up in the 80s. And um, I uh, just for fun today, I looked up what are the ingredients in a piece of real fruit flat out? And here's a little screenshot of what I found. Um, so uh, the first thing I noticed was that the most prevalent ingredient is not actually fruit, it's maltodextrin, which is basically sugar. Um, then we have concentrated fruit puree, which is only 24% of the product, which is quite interesting. And then we have sugar, which is presumably less than 24%, but still looks like it's probably a quite significant ingredient. So we've got sugar, fruit and sugar. <laughs> and a lot of the other things in there are not necessarily harmful, but um, it's, it's a very complicated product, shall we say. Whereas the fruit leathers that I make, uh, the ingredients are um, fruit <laughs> and uh, honey sometimes, if I feel it needs a little bit of extra sugar. This is what the natural product looks like. And if you know the commercial product, you'll see, oh yes, there's something quite different going on there. Uh, but you can make these at home very easily and they're quite lovely and um, kids often seem to like them when they're in this format. And uh, so I thought I'd give you a, a few steps if you want to replicate these at home. So for fruit leathers, you're going to stew the fruit and then puree it. You might need to add a little bit of water so that the fruit doesn't burn when it's starting to cook. And if you've got a very juicy fruit, like most berries, for example, I often combine them with a different fruit that's a bit more bulky, uh, like apples as a classic, uh, so that they um, have something that's left behind once they've been dried. Uh, berries, often you'll just get a powder because there's just not much bulk in them. So do some combinations if you need to, to get the right consistency. And then line an oven tray with some parchment paper um, you, you could try just spraying it with oil, but I actually think parchment paper is really useful for fruit leathers because you can uh, sort of handle them a, a little bit quicker. Then you're going to pour a thin layer of puree across the tray and spread it around if needed to cover. And I'd like it to be around five mil or half a centimetre thick um, so that it dries fairly quickly. Then you'll dehydrate it using your chosen methods. I usually do these in the oven, but you could also do them um, using some of the other methods. When you think the leather is going to be firm enough to handle, you're going to peel away the parchment paper and flip the whole thing over so that the back can also dry um, a little bit faster. And then once it feels like leather, there's a reason why we call them fruit leather, you can just cut them into any strips or any shape you like um, with scissors and then pop them away in your airtight jar in a cool, dark place. And they're a real treat. I love to make these. Um, so here's a couple on the centre and the right hand side. A wild apple and blackberry fruit leather with my mate Adrian's honey. And um, the apples are from um, Dalesford and um, what did I get from Box Hill? Box Hill, I can't quite read that there. This is an old photograph. <laughs> um, anyway, lovely, um, uh, lovely one. And then I did a Fajoa and apple leather uh, from some of my produce and some of my friend's produce. Okay, um, let me know if you've got any questions about the drying process, anything you'd like me to clarify. I was gonna take some time at the end and see if you are interested in any other methods or techniques. Um, I, um, for example, use a steam juicer to bottle my grape juice and I can talk about that if anybody is likely to need to know that. Um, we could also talk a little bit about some of these other methods you can see on the screen. So let me know what questions you have about these and which ones you're interested in and I can go through them. 
Uh, okay, we've got a question about steam juicing. Yeah, so if you want to bottle a fruit juice, you can absolutely use any kind of household juicer that you might have or be able to borrow. Um, but there is this piece of equipment called a steam juicer, which has totally blown my mind now that I've experienced them and is most definitely more convenient and um, easier, just better than using a household juicer, I feel. So how this works is this saucepan structure over here has water uh, simmering or boiling in the bottom. It has your fruit in the top in what looks like a colander. And then it has this middle layer, the magical middle layer. And I still cannot explain to you the physics of this, but what happens when you leave this on the stove for a while is you have juice that accumulates in this middle layer, like magic. <laughs> it is like magic. And so from this little hose that is just folded up here for storage, uh, this hose, you can tap it off into bottles um, directly. And then, um, uh, look, I think you need to do some kind of um, cold pack or heat process with, with this juice because it's not quite hot enough and sure enough uh, as it comes off the steam juicer. Um, but I know some people have tried just storing it based on the heat from this steam juicing process alone um, with reasonable results. Uh, so, look, a steam juicer, you probably have to buy it on the internet. I haven't seen them even in preserving shops. Maybe they exist. Um, but it's very, very simple and low tech and um, just so much easier than having a massive pulp and pips flying around your kitchen from the juicer and um, just, just some of the really frustrating cleanup that had to happen when I was using the household juicer to bottle my grapes. Uh, so that's steam juicing and it's more of a piece of equipment, not, not a preserving method. Uh, but if you've got a grapevine that's very productive and you want to be bottling regularly, I would um, try and find one. Veronique is asking about jam. And um, the reason I'm not covering jam in a lot of detail tonight is that when I've taught it to people, I show people how much sugar goes in compared to fruit. And most people go, oh, I don't think I'll be eating as much jam anymore because the ratio is about 50% fruit to 50% jam. And you can edge that back slightly but often your jam will have a more liquid consistency because jam is about the magic between uh, the acid, the pectin and the sugar. And that's what creates that set jammy consistency. Um, Veronique, your question uh, is about getting mold on your jam after a few weeks. And that suggests to me, it could be a couple of things. The sugar content might not be very high, um, but probably more importantly, the um, jar has not been sterilised correctly. And uh, technically to do jams well, you need to go through the open kettle method that we've talked about tonight or the, um, uh, the hot pack. And food scientists would actually tell you once you've done that to do that extra, um, the, the extra boiling water bath step uh, to prevent the mould from getting in. So there's, there's quite a lot that could be going on in there. I know there are some experienced jam makers listening, so feel free to pop your own comments in the chat window. Feel free to disagree with me as well if you've got some other ideas about what's going on. And I should say, I have a section on jam in the notes uh, that if you don't have already, you can get from Sarah after the session. And so I hope that that will give you a few more tips. Um, lid doesn't fit well. Can you give me a bit more information on that one? Uh, just so I can know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I just want to check in with Sarah if there's anything else that might have cropped up that I've missed along the way and also check in with you as a group and see if there's any other questions you might have had as we've gone through the session. No. Okay, Sarah's saying no. Uh, uh, that was a tip, I see. I've made jams before, but when I used a loose fitting lid, they all went mouldy. Yeah, so again, that's a great pickup. Uh, be checking all of those lids and uh, the jars as well to make sure that there's no chips or, or cracks. All right, so we're coming towards the end of the session and I wanna make sure that you've got some resources if you want to follow up. And luckily for us in this part of the world, we've got 
fantastic resources and local suppliers that we can access for preserving equipment. Hopefully you won't need too much and hopefully you've seen a lot of things in your kitchen can be used for preserving. But if you'd like to look at any things like jar lifters or um, extra lids, for example, um, you can get them from these sorts of places. I um, frequent Costante Imports in Preston and I love it. And we also have Home Make It that's a really fantastic business in a couple of locations, uh, all dedicated to home food processing and preservation. Uh, you can also get extra jars and lids in different sizes from Bellina Art and Garden and from a place called Cospack. And I've never been there, but Artisans Bateja in West Melbourne is another uh, home food um, processing and preserving business. You might have your own places as well that you know about. I'd love you to pop them in the chat window if you can tell me about any more. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so the comment I can see, I also use salicylic acid as a preservative. That's interesting. I haven't used that one myself. Um, Yolan, thanks for letting me know. I'll look it up. Radio. So uh, just to cap it off, there's lots of preserving books out there and I actually don't have a favourite one, which is why I'm not recommending one for you here. The only proviso I make is when you are looking at a preserving book, try and get a more modern one, because as I've described, there are important steps in the method that have been updated with uh, modern food um, studies and science. So I recommend that. Uh, the closest thing I've got to a free uh, and great resource for you is the Guide to Home Canning. And this is from the National Centre for Home Food Preservation, which is uh, in the US. So a little note here is that in the US, they call bottling canning, but there is a piece of equipment called a pressure canner that is used for low acid fruits and vegetables. And that is a completely different process that we've not covered tonight. So I hope that avoids some confusion. Uh, and you can have a look at this guide and it will just go through steps for safety in bottling, emphasising, of course, the cold pack method, uh, as I've discussed tonight. So I'm not seeing many more questions or comments, so I'm going to wrap it up there. And it's been a pleasure talking through one of my passions with you. I hope that you're feeling confident to have a go. And uh, I want to encourage you to um, connect with me on Instagram. I'm going to jump back on it soon if you've got any questions. And I also really, really love to see photographs of what you've made uh, and been trying at home. So thanks again for having me. And I'm going to hand back to Sarah.